how we should go about managing our patients with diabetes. So what we see is that we need to sort of evaluate them appropriately as we have seen from the India diabetes study also which I just presented some of the results from that India diabetes study. We have seen that uh, there is a need for proper evaluation of all the risk factors for cardiovascular disease and the presence of any of the comorbidities that we are speaking of and also looking at them in a holistic way so as to provide them individualized care. The ADA guidelines very elegantly speak about you know the targets, glycemic targets being very flexible, being very tight in people who are newly diagnosed, who have a uh, short history of diabetes, who do not have other comorbidities, who have a very low risk of hypoglycemia and who have a very long life expectancy where we need to be very aggressive and keep a target HbA1c of less than 7% or even less than 6.5% in such individuals. Whereas those who have got a longer duration of diabetes, other comorbidities, have cardiovascular disease, have a high risk of hypoglycemia because of various factors. In all these individuals, we need to be less stringent in our target, be more flexible, allow them to keep their HbA1c close to about 8% or so and see that they don't have problems because of hypoglycemia or because of iatrogenic problems. So this is how our care should be personalized, we should be individualized and should be person-centered what diet they should follow is to use a plate method where you are very pictorially or a graphic way you can tell them that you know half the plate should be filled with vegetables and fruits which contain a lot of fiber which have antioxidant we have different other components which are provided by these and then you look at one fourth of it comes from whole grains cereals which are providing the carbohydrate content to the diet and then we have a significant amount of protein which is constituting about one fourth of the plate and this should be in the form of either fish, poultry, beans or nuts. Limit the red meat and cheese, avoid bacon, cold cuts and other processed meats and keeping the oil intake also to a restricted with using healthy oils like olive oil, canola for cooking or on salads and at the table. Limit butter intake and avoid trans fats completely. Discussing about physical activity, we should highlight if you look at the guidelines given from ADA very clearly they say that you know all adults with type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes should engage in at least 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity aerobic activity every week which is spread over at least three days per week with no more than two consecutive days of without activity the other important aspect is that uh, two to three sessions of resistance exercise per week on non-consecutive days is also very useful because it provides uh, which it has significant effect on the insulin sensitivity and it, they also speak about avoiding sedentary behavior and avoiding prolonged sitting. We ask our patients to get up every one hour, have a walk around their office or wherever they work around their workplace and come back and go back to their work and also encouraging flexibility and muscle strength. All these are important in terms of managing diabetes. Having looked at that, now let's move on to the pharmacological aspects of management of diabetes, mechanisms, different factors contributing to the development of hyperglycemia in individuals with diabetes. We have the ominous octet which says that you know not only the insulin secretory defect is important, insulin resistance is important but also the other factors like the incretin defect which is addressed by some of the agents like the DPP-4 inhibitors or the GLP-1 analogs and then we have other factors like the increased glucose reabsorption and the kidney which is addressed by agents like the SGLT-2 inhibitors. So all in all we say that we have eight different mechanisms which are contributing and use of agents which can address more than one of these factors may be helpful and in sometimes we may even combine agents which address different pathophysiological abnormalities so as to get the best benefit. Now we have moved on towards era where we are speaking of combination therapy right at the onset of diabetes and also using thinking of using other agents other than metformin even as the first line therapy. The European Society of Cardiology was the first one which gave out a guideline in 2019 where they spoke about using SGLT2 inhibitors and the GLP-1 analogs which have shown to have significant cardiovascular benefits they have spoken of using these agents even before metformin so this guideline which illustrates the european society of cardiology guideline and which speaks of the use of even in in people who are drug naive with type 2 diabetes if they have a very high risk of ascvd that is atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or have a pre-existing atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease they have suggested the use of sglt2 inhibitors or glp1 analogs even before metformin and even in those who are on metformin with such a history you could consider stopping the metformin and shifting to 
one of these agents or if they are not under control adding the SGLT2 inhibitors or GLP-1 analogs on metformin. Even if they were on metformin and had good glycemic control you would think of substituting metformin with these agents. And then they speak of the next phase that you would consider other agents and if there is no ACVD risk and we are looking at uh, mainly the glycemic targets then we are looking at uh, using other agents as are listed here. And if you look at the AAC guideline, this is again a very progressive guideline which has classifies people based on the HbA1c at onset of diabetes. That if you have got a HbA1c of more than 6.5 and less than 7.5, that is a time when you look at a single agent and try to focus on deciding which therapy you will be using in metformin. It can be between GLP-1 RA, it can be between SGLT2 inhibitors, DPP-4 inhibitors or going down the list you could have TZDs, AGIs or sulfonylureas. So the choice would depend on the presence or absence of other comorbidities like atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. If that is present or if CKD is present then you should choose SGLT2 inhibitor or a GLP-1 analog. And in the absence of these, you could choose any of them based on convenience. You could even look at using a DPP-4 inhibitor when you are concerned about hypoglycemia. And you could consider even AGI when you have predominantly postprandial hyperglycemia. And you would also think of SGLT2 inhibitor or GLP-1 in case you have other factors which are probably limiting the use of any of the other agents. While people who are their entry A1C is between 7.5 to 9, the suggestion is to use dual therapy or triple therapy right at onset of diabetes and again one of them should be metformin and the other one could be decided based on the other comorbidities that are presence of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or renal disease or any of the other comorbidities. Now if entry level HB1C is more than 9, uh, this of the AAC suggests use of insulin right at onset or even they suggest triple therapy or insulin if the patient is symptomatic with symptoms of hyperglycemia that is presence of weakness, tiredness or weight loss, significant weight loss. In all these situations, they suggest the use of insulin right at the onset of diabetes. So this is how the American Association of Clinical Endocrinology speaks about the choice of various therapies at the onset of diabetes in a patient who presents with diabetes. Look at the presence of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or renal disease. Look at the age, the BMI. Quickly, I'll just uh, deal with each of these classes of drugs, the SGLT2 inhibitors, particularly the DPP4 inhibitors and the sulfonylureas. Mm -hmm.